welcome to lesson number 40, the last lesson of this course. So, we have come to the end of the journey and it is time to recollect the places that we had seen. So, in the last lesson we will take a quick review of the course, all the lessons that we have taken and finally, we will make some concluding comments. So, <coughs> let us recall the objective and nature of the course as we had stated it in lesson number 1. So, the objective is to provide an exposure to the technologies that enable operation and control of modern industrial machines and systems. So, in short, I, I wanted it so that if you go and visit a factory which produces something, discrete manufacturing processes, steel plant, auto factory, you should be able to uh, recognize much of the equipment and systems that you see and also be able to make out how they work, right. So, that was the basic objective. So, as we stated in lesson number 1 that this is essentially a user's view. So, you we for a large body of technologies which <coughs> are used in for automation in various types of industries, we want to understand basically how they work and uh, help in producing things rather than you know contrasted to user's view is the designer's view. So, we do not want to uh, this is this course is meant to be so in depth that you can start designing some of that equipment that would be that would be an order of magnitude enhancement of depth and we have not attempted that here. We said that we will keep it application oriented. So, whenever we you know talk about a technology we will try to make it always talk in, in the context of its use. So, how that does that help? We will mainly talk about existing technologies not very cutting edge technologies, but some sometimes we will we'll also try to capture the trends that are happening in industrial automation. And we said that this is going to be an in interdisciplinary kind of course in the sense that uh, a lot of people, although this is predominantly electrical in the sense that a lot of the depth or the exposure that is expected in the electrical discipline is more than in the other disciplines, but I guess still <coughs> industrial automation uh, technology is necessarily interdisciplinary and therefore of interdisciplinary interest. So, it, it, it should it will always be you know it, it, it should be possible for uh, somebody from mechanical or chemical uh, to go through this course maybe with a little bit of uh, extra effort in building up the background in some of the electrical parts. So, that was the idea of the course that to provide a view towards the breadth of automation technologies used in the variety of factories and to, to try to understand the basic operational issues in that. In that was in lesson 1. <coughs> so, that was the major objective of the course. Then in lesson 1 we you know we started the course in a very general note and try to define industrial automation. So, we try to motivate, we try to basically see how you know if we see that automation is I mean an industry is a systematic economic activity. So, and its primary objective is to make profit, uh, then we try to find out how automation helps in making profit. And then we found that we introduced the concept of economy of scale and scope that you know in and showed that in both respects automation helps. We looked at the various types of production systems, the various types of fa factories, batch processes, continuous processes, job shops, various kinds. 
And finally, we categorize the classes of automation system, fixed automation, flexible automation, integrated automation. So, <coughs> and try to uh, try to discuss that which kind of automation is actually good for what kind of uh, factories. So, and then we in the next lesson we took a look at the architecture of industrial automation systems and we introduced the automation pyramid and the levels of automation. So, we talked about the levels 0 of sensors and actuators, then level 1 of automatic control of various, various protections, alarms, then supervisory control, process monitoring, set point optimization, then production control, scheduling, maintenance, management, inventory, then finally enterprise control where we basically finance, business, HRD, marketing and we said that all these for for today's modern efficient factories all these have to be integrated and they must continuously exchange information from the field and decisions from the various parts in in both ways right and this this must be enabled by some sort of an industrial industrial communication system so we also said at this point of time that in this course we are going to mainly concentrate on level uh, 0 and 1 and we said that that is primarily industrial automation and the higher layers are more 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 in the realm of industrial information technology and uh, we are not going to cover that in this course so we started with level 0 and we first talked about the sensing system. So, we first took an abstract view of a measurement systems and found what are their typical structures, what are their typical static characteristics and dynamic characteristics by which you can describe the uh, performance of any abstract instrument. We also looked at some you know typical sensor specifications of industrial sensors. Then having done that, having taken a look at an abstract sensor we started taking look at the exact I mean the, the individual sensors for the typical process variables which are measured and which are you know controlled in an industrial environment like temperature. So, we talked about various kinds of temperature sensors and of course, their you know <coughs> signal processing circuits. We talked about pressure, force and torque sensors. So, low pressure, high pressure, force measurement, strain gauges, torque measurement and then we talked about position, velocity and acceleration sensing, you know position, velocity and acceleration, position and velocity sensing are very important for uh, manufacturing because you know from, from the point of view of manufacturing accuracies. So, we talked about position sensing, for example, speed control is actually a very, very, very important uh, function. So, so, position and velocity sense, sensing. So, we talked about position sensing various techniques resistive, inductive, capacitive, velocity sensing with various electromag electromagnetic sensing, optical sensing techniques as well as acceleration sensing. Then we took a look at flow measurement. Flow measurement is you know very uh, one of the most widely measured and controlled variable in especially in process industries flow because as we have said that you know for 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 temperature control you have to do flow control for example steam flow control for uh, level control you all you obviously have to do flow control because level is nothing but flow integrated so for for pressure control you also have to do flow control <coughs> because pressure is also you know in a way flow integrated and then flow control is obviously flow control so so, the major, major variables pressure, level, flow, temperature all these in many cases come back to flow control and flow control implies flow sensing. So, flow, flow measurement is actually a very important uh, component of process control. So, we talked about various uh, the obstructive methods of measurement including you know uh, uh, differential pressure flow meters like orifice and venturi, rotameters, turbine flow meters. We also talked about non obstructive methods like electromagnetic flow meter, <coughs> ultrasonic flow meters, cross correlation flow meters and things like that. 
after flow measurement we took a look at signal conditioning the signal conditioning today is uh, you know electronics is giving us this feature the signal conditioning is uh, very important and uh, there are some typical you know for instrumentation there are some typical signal conditioners which are used with a large type of large number of sensors so we talked about deflection bridges both resistive capacitive then various types of amplifiers you know voltage amplifiers current amplifiers voltage controlled current amplifiers charge amplifiers so uh, we took took a uh, look took looks at varied kind of amplifiers then filters filters are very important for you know removing noise so filters active and passive filters then phase sensitive demodulation demodulators i mean in many cases the raw signal out of the sensor comes in a modulated fashion for example lvdts or strain gauge bridges so it one needs to extract or demodulate the actual uh, process variable that one is interested in so that requires a phase sensitive demodulator circuit so we introduce that then various other kinds of circuits like sample and hold multipliers and multiplexers we talked about then we took a look at measurement noise and errors you know measurement noise and errors are as so how how does noise get coupled to a sensor and as we have seen as we will see that noise is actually very important because noise uh, reduces measurement accuracy it also creates problems when when a when a sensor is, is 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 giving feedback to a to a process control loop so if there is noise in the sensor then then as we have seen that the whole process control loop will start oscillating noise can also give you noise and errors can also give you other kinds of for example quality control problems they can give you dimension errors so <coughs> so there we need to understand how noise gets coupled in circuits and some of the techniques and precautions to be taken and then still we have to live with noise and we have to we have to characterize it so we have to know that the that the performance that that we are getting out of our measurement systems to what extent it is certain and to what extent it is uncertain so we need to you know characterize we need to build a model of models of measurement errors so that we uh, we can specify our the quality of our products so uh, this is so we talked about measurement errors and then we talked about that e each individual you know typically uh, a system consists of subsystems so even measurement systems have various subsystems so so there can be a primary sensor there can be a secondary sensor then a then a signal conditioner then a signal processor now each of them have their individual noise characteristics so these these noises are generated and they get propagated through the system and so we we also discuss that if noise is propagated how does it uh, how does the how does it affect the final readings of the instrument <coughs> finally in today's automated environments the sensors are typically connected to the data acquisition systems which are connected to the computers so that you know these uh, process variables which are the which is the final reality in the field and which is the real story about the production process so that we can one can measure it sense it analyze it uh, monitor it control it so all that is today done by computers so one of the first things is to get these process level signals into the computer and that is done through data acquisition systems so we took <coughs> a look at the architecture of data acquisition system what they are made of and how they you know get the data into the computer so we started with sampling then we talked about analog to digital conversion and finally we uh, talked about the interface with the computer and the software which lets a human being or a computer program uh, see the data analyze the data for control purposes this this has completed so you see that we started with an abstract measurement system then we took looks at some specific you know the major process variables of measurement then we took a look at the typical signal processing circuits that are used for instrumentation and measurement then we took at 
a look at the noises and the uncertainties and the measurement errors and <coughs> finally we took at took a look at the data acquisition systems which gets the data into our computer so we have after that now the once the data in the, is in the computer we need to we came to the second module of the course which is on which is on automatic control so we have come first we have covered sensing then we have come to automatic control and in automatic control the first in the beginning we you know talked about the basic purpose of control and uh, what are the what are the what are the typical performance uh, issues like stability like you know steady state errors like transient what is what is what is the goal of a controller and then <coughs> we we talked about the sources which uh, you know create problems in control like you know disturbance so having understood these general concepts we first took up pid control which is which is the still people say that even with so much advanced controls about you know 80 to 90% of all industrial controllers are pid so it's important that 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 pid controllers are looked at thoroughly so we talked about the basic pv uh, pi and d modes then the various parameters like process uh, <coughs> uh, proportional band integral time and derivative times the effects of these changing these the, these parameters on the transient performance of the plant and the steady state performance the there are some problems with d and i modes and how to circumvent them then we talked about pid controller tuning so these gains have to be properly set so that you have good response and your uh, because the response of the control loop is as we have said is directly related to a to a to a number of quantities like you know like mainly product quality the energy efficiency raw materials that you are consuming and things like that so it's very important to have control loops well tuned so that uh, efficiency of production can be achieved so we looked at various uh, methods of tuning starting from you know direct computation I and mean, analytical computation based on models then empirical tuning which are based on experimental results and <coughs> and finally we took we took a look at auto tuning so auto tuning is that the the controller itself examines the input output signal and then decides and the, and from there it it uh, decides the best uh, controller parameters for this process and then downloads it into the controller i mean basically sets the uh, pid controller parameters as as those values so without human intervention intervention and we described the method using you know relay control systems so after pid controller tuning we took we took a look at various different control structures which give great advantages in certain very common industrial situations in control like we started with feed forward and ratio control feed forward control is typically can give you very good performance in the face of uh, disturbance if disturbance is is measurable we also looked at ratio control which is a kind of feed forward control then we took a look at typical techniques to control process time delays which are which are very common because of you know material flow times etc in in process systems and also non minimum phase systems where uh, which are also uh, some not uncommon and uh, for example in a drum level control so in such situations some special control structures are actually required for for effective uh, control of the process so we looked at these two particular kinds of processes namely time delay systems and inverse response processes and then found uh, introduced some particular control structures which are used for controlling this then we looked at some special control structures which use multiple sensors that is multiple measurements in a loop or multiple actuation points so so in particular first we looked at cascade control and explained that how uh, <coughs> it can give you much improved performance than in non cascade control if 
some intermediate variables can be measured. Similarly, we took a look at uh, selective control. Selective control is a control where you know you, you typically use for controlling specially distributed uh, equipment something like you know boilers uh, or furnaces. Similarly, multi actuator control where the same there is only one variable being controlled, but that may be controlled using several actuators. So, typical case will be let us say uh, HVAC control that is heating, ventilation, air conditioning control where the same room temperature is controlled, but when it is below ambient it is controlled using a different equipment or, the, or uh, some kind of a chiller or air conditioning while if it is to be maintained above ambient then you use heaters. Similarly, we can use split range control. Uh, so, that this is this is this is split range control and then we can use override control you know sometimes you you operate a plant for uh, let us say let us say I mean from time to time your plant operational policy can change. So, sometimes you can you can operate for a maximizing production, sometimes you can operate for uh, minimizing some 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 energy condition uh, some some emergency condition or for from the point of view of safety. So, there can be you know various ways of controlling. So, I mean sometimes you can control using there may be two valves and you can operate either one of them sometimes. <coughs> so, in such a case I mean the when 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 one control policy actually at times overrides the other and then drives a different actuator, but the same control variable is being controlled in such case we have override control. So, in other words we first looked at PID in depth and then we looked at certain uh, very special control structures which gives significant benefit. And finally, we took a look at you know some the factors which limit performance typically the characteristics of sensors, the characteristics of actuators you know all actuators have their uh, rate limits as well as position limits. So, uh, even if you so I mean if you think a very large input can be given to a plant it actually cannot given for uh, actuator limitations and it is from for, and it is for these reasons that the so called theoretical uh, responses cannot be obtained. So, these these constraints put a limit on the performance of the control loop and <coughs> similarly we have we can we have limitations on sensors <coughs> and we also have limitations on the process dynamics or in other words degrees of freedom that is things are related and we cannot have we cannot all the time it is not possible to have absolutely independent control. So, that is how, mu how much of independent control you can actually achieve depends on the degrees of freedom. So, these are some of the factors that actually limit you know control performance of uh, industrial uh, systems. Then we talked about the implementation and in specifically we talked about how the PID algorithm can be implemented in in various ways and how they are practically implemented in the in uh, commercial industrial controllers. And <coughs> finally, we talked about little bit about uh, advanced process control that is in fact, we uh, have not in this control module we have not talked about some of the uh, advanced process controls that uh, are slowly being introduced. So, um, for example, uh, we have not talked about model predictive control or nonlinear model predictive control, we have not talked about uh, internal model controls or other other kinds of control like state feedback controls. We have not talked about decoupling, so there are there are there are, there are several topics that we have not talked about. But, uh, but still uh, we talked about the major uh, common control structure. Having talked in terms of the continuous controls we shifted to logic controls which are also equally important and equally prevalent uh, in industrial manufacturing which basically control sequence of operations of machines and uh, generate you know they are they are often sometimes used for protection sometimes used for supervisory control where you know several sequences of control modes are are executed sometimes they are used for generating alarms 
uh, they are most more commonly used in uh, uh, discrete manufacturing. So, we first took a brief look at the theory of you know any, any, any control is actually based on models. So, we took a, took a look at some discrete event system models which and then try to introduce and captured some of the you know industrial sequence control problems in terms of this discrete event systems model. Then we introduced the programmable logic controller or the PLC. It is a it is a it is a class of equipment which sell in the market which uh, carry out most of the sequence control. And then we introduced the programming languages for this logic control which are used is used in PLCs, so in namely uh, the relay ladder logic. Then we explain how PLCs work, how they you know how they get data, compute outputs and then finally download into the field. We also introduce the RLL programming elements as the basic, uh, basic programming elements and started discussing simple RLL programs. Then we talked about other RLL program features, various kinds of statements, arithmetic, data move and program control operations and other some, some other some other mic, I mean macro operations. Uh, which are basically a collection of <coughs> I mean a fixed ca fixed collection of uh, elementary operations. Finally, we introduced uh, a systematic method by which uh, these PLC controllers can be uh, PLC programs can be written for uh, for some for some industrial control problems. So, we modeled the process as a state machine and then based on that state machine we discussed how we can write a relay ladder logic program. In the last lesson we talked about the PLC hardware environment, the exact the kinds of processors, the specific typical specifications of processor memory IO, the buses, bus extension, various kinds of special purpose IO modules like function modules, distributed IO modules various kinds of communication and networking modules like you know industrial ethernet. Then the, the devices that are used for programming PLCs, I mean developing programs and then, then downloading and finally you know man machine interfaces like which are which can be connected with PLCs. So, this completes our logic control uh, module and we come to one of the application areas namely CNC machines which are typically used for, manuf for, for discrete manufacturing all over the world. So, we looked at the basic structural features and the basic operational features of CNC machines and how they, they, are, they are programmed that is how the various cutting operations can be specified so that the machine can operate by itself. We also looked at the typical kinds of you know actuation requirements for these machines and also took a look at the, the, the huge advantages that these machines can sometimes give you. In the next lesson we took a more detailed look at how the you know in a CNC machine there are basically you have to create when you have to have when you are doing manufacturing you are actually removing metal by this shearing. So, relative motion between the between the job and the tool has to be created. So, for that the job has to move and the tool also has to move. So, typically what happens is that one of these motions is rotational and the other motion is translational. So, in any case there are, there are precise you know uh, position control, speed control uh, requirements on these on these actuations or on these drives. So, that the part dimensions are good and the part surface finishes are good. So, to understand how these motion commands are generated and how the motion control is actually carried out this 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 precision control in the CNC machines. In lesson 24 we looked at various kinds of command generation strategies like by interpolation then we took basically two kinds of control system called reference pulse and reference word systems and, and, and how to generate them and we actually took at took a look at one open loop reference pulse control and closed loop reference pulse and reference uh, word control systems. So, the after that we took a look at 
flow control valve. Flow control valves are very, very common and uh, important elements in uh, factories. So, we looked at three major kinds of valves, globe, bulb and butterfly valves and we, we took a look at the flow characteristics, their, their constructions and how the valves are moved and how the valves are moved precisely. For example, we took a look at uh, you know uh, valve positioners and what advantage these these positioners give you. After flow control valves, we took started taking a look at hydraulics and pneumatics. So, first we took a look at hydraulics where we understood the basic principles, Pascal's law, then major hydraulic system components, and then we took look took a look at the components one by one. That is, we took a look at pumps and the motors. We took a look at the hydraulic valves, <coughs> both you know. Uh, direction control valves as well as servo valves and then we finally look at the final actuated control element or hydraulic cylinders. Then in the next lesson we actually continued this and we took a look at flow and pressure control valves and uh, previously we mainly took a look at direction control valves. Now we took flow and pressure control valves, hydraulic cylinders, then two kinds of valves which are used very much in controls that is the analog flow control. So, they are the proportional valve and the servo valve. So, and then finally, we, do, we took a look at an electro hydraulic actuation system. In lesson 28, we took, we took a look at various typical industrial hydraulic circuits and saw how these techniques can be applied for industrial purposes. Then we came to pneumatics. Pneumatics is very similar to hydraulics, but there are slight differences. So, we took a look at system components again, compressors, pneumatic valves and their accessories. And finally, we took, at look, took a look at pneumatic logic, various kinds of reciprocating and then various kinds of typical pneumatic circuits like, like reciprocating circuits, reciprocating circuits with uh, rapid retracts, reciprocating circuits with uh, <coughs> uh, regeneration. So, that you know the pressure energy is not uh, wasted and then various kinds of sequencing circuits. After that we took a look at electric actuators, but before taking a look at electric actuators we first understood that why it is a it is a definite trend in the among the industrial control uh, or drives that people are going for variable speed drives. Now, variable speed drives, what, so what is the basic advantage of variable speed drives and showing that variable speed drives can be huge, very significant energy uh, savers. So, we first took a look at, we actually compared, you know fans and pumps are the predominant devices which are driven by motors. So, we found out that if the system load has a certain amount of variation, then having a variable frequency, although although it is capital intensive, it is, it is actually more expensive and more capital has to, be in, has to be invested. But you know this capital cost actually is actually coming down as the cost of power electronics is coming down. And on the other hand, the cost of energy is going up. So, it now really makes a lot of sense to have variable speed drives since they uh, can save a lot of energy and we saw basically from a pump or fan characteristic as as to how a variable speed drive can can make significant saving of energy to the extent of some sometimes 50 60 percent or even 100 percent having convinced ourselves about the requirement for variable speed drives we took a look at first dc motor drive which is the most common and uh, so, we understood the basic concept of operation of DC motors and then we took two things, two, two different kinds of DC motor drives. One is a line frequency AC DC converter drive that is rectifier, which is used for adjustable speed drives. You know adjustable speed drives are and servo drives are two different things. In adjustable speed drive, speed, speed, speed can be changed, but generally the drive is, is, is operated for significant amounts of time at a particular speed reference. 
while in servo drives the speed continuously keeps changing. So, we the kinds of you know power electronic drives that you use for adjustable speed drives and servo drives are different. So, we took a look at two different kinds of drives one with a converter, one with a rectifier AC DC uh, converter and another with a DC DC converter. So, we went on this is a continuation lesson number 33 of uh, this switch mode DC DC converters and then we also you know since, since these are used for BLDC drives we also took a look at brushless DC drives which are essentially AC motors. Then we took a look at induction motor drives and may, in, in the case of induction motors we mainly concentrated towards the adjustable speed drive because induction motors are generally not used for servo drives although they can be but they are much less used for servo drives generally DC and nowadays more BLDC drives are being used. So, then we look last we do took a look at two kinds of motor drives one is one are stepper motors which are used for which are very which are very simple uh, very simple and cheap drive electronics and are used for non critical applications and for smaller applications having smaller power ratings and then we also took it took a more detailed look at BLDC drives which are becoming very very uh, popular basically because of the because of the magnet and improvements in magnet technology. Then we uh, so this you know completes actuation and then <coughs> it turns out that Electronics is making sig very significant inroads into all, all areas of technology and also into industrial automation. So, now what is happening is that most of the industrial automation devices like sensors, actuators, valves, they are they have they are having electronics on the field or electronics embedded in them. So, they are all becoming you know microprocessor control devices which have which are which 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 give previously I mean huge capability to these you know elect mechanical or electromechanical devices. So, now you, you know you, you can have a you can have a flow control valve which uh, which is which has electronics on it which can do all sorts of signal processing auto calibration it can it can send values it can it can it can monitor its own failures it can uh, calibrate itself it can even connect on a network. So, all this is possible because uh, every device is getting is having a I mean computing and um, uh, electronics technology embedded in them. So, so we thought that you know it is a it is a it is it's a good thing to take a look at the basic embedded system technology because it is so becoming so common and 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 all pervasive in in all aspects of of our life and 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 also industrial automation. So, so we took a look at you know embedded system embedded systems and understood its basic types of hardware components and basic software characteristic the kind of software that are used in that. Then we took a look at you know many of these systems are actually operate for example, a, a CNC machine a CNC machine has uh, various at least 3 4 processors it has access controllers it has PLCs uh, it may also have you know uh, front end processors which manage the man machine interface. So, all these this 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 multiprocessor complex systems generally work under you know uh, some sort of a real time operating system. So, we took a look at real time operating systems and their features and uh, the one of the essences of real time operating systems is that there are several time critical tasks I mean which are in parallel executed in the system. So, how to schedule them which one will be computed after what whether they can be interrupted in the middle or not under what conditions. So, these are one of the one of the major aspects of real time computing which is uh, which is a feature of embedded systems used for industrial automation. So, we took a look took a look at this real time task scheduling the basic principles of it. Now, once you have this embedded embedded I mean devices with this embedded electronics and embedded processors in them then <coughs> the there is I mean the whole new world of opportunities open up. So, now since you have processors on each of these devices these devices these devices should be able to communicate with each other and there is very significant benefit that can that can arise 
out of this communication. I mean, a much much more significant coordination would be possible, and you know, optimization would be possible. Lot of data can be acquired, knowledge can be gained, operations can be always kept in a very tuned manner by you know continuous adaptation. So all sorts of uh, you know uh, documentation can be made. So all sorts of benefits can accrue if these intelligent automation devices can be made to communicate. So it is from this this concept that now people are saying that this these, these devices all should be on a network. So, and one of the very emerging and very prominent network standards for the industrial automation market is the field bus. So, in the in this lesson and the next, the in lesson number 37, the field bus uh, protocol, network protocol was looked at. So, it like all network protocols, this is also uh, organized in terms of you know various kinds of layers. Uh, I mean, you know, in a in a network data is the whole soft uh, data basically goes gets transformed you are uh, at the top level you are generating information and when you are sending it down finally it is becoming ones and zeros and it is at the destination those ones and zeros are being received and they are being processed in various ways so that finally you get back the information so this is uh, actually carried out through a layers of software so we have first talked about so we started discussing and we in this lesson we talked about the physical and the data link layers the, the various features and the network protocol architectures and also the mechanism of arbitrating communication rights you know one of the one of the one of the problems of uh, having a bus is that the, the the bus is electrically shared and therefore it, people cannot i mean the devices only one device can talk at a time so there is a need to understand who is going to talk when so there are elaborate rules have to be formulated for that otherwise when somebody is talking or some device is transmitting data on the network if if another device starts transmitting the the i mean some different data on the same network then the data can be get corrupted so we took a look at some of these models of you know arbitrating communication rights on the buses and taking a look at how that that uh, actually, it turns out for cyclic and acyclic communication. Once the basic, so this you know it will ensure that the basic data packets at the low level they can get transmitted reliably from one point to the other, and then you have to talk about uh, the 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 application and the user layers. So how uh, that is when one device looks at another device, how it comes to know that what is the how that device is made of what what is it doing the the interpretation of the variables that one device is sending to the other so all these issues are dealt with at the application and the user layers and we mainly discuss the function blocks which is uh, which is which is the abstract model for any field bus device and we also discuss the issue of you know obtaining synchronization throughout the network so doing network management and doing doing time management over the network this more or less completes you know so, so if you if you go back you have seen that we have discussed sensors that was in the first module then we have discussed controls both analog controls as well as sequence controls and then we discussed various types of actuators so we discussed flow control valves we discuss hydraulics we discuss pneumatics and we discuss electrics that is basically motor drives and we also discuss that how these can uh, save a lot of power so then finally we discuss the electronics which give makes them intelligent and makes them and enables communication among them so once you have all these devices this level 1 and level 0 devices on the network so all their data are available then it it would be possible to do system wide coordination and 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 system wide optimization and in fact the, it is precisely this which is done at the automations are at level 2 and level 3 in, in absence of this electronics and communication typically this these uh, these optimizations and these coordinations are done at a much slower scale 
basically by the operator. So this is the operator just take look at take looks at those values and then they operate the process. But once these data are available on the computers over the network, then there, there are possibilities of uh, doing much faster and much more pervasive uh, coordination among in the factory. So actually that is what is to be done, that is what is done in the case of uh, in uh, level 2 and level 3 automations. So in the last, in the, in the penultimate, uh, in the penultimate <coughs> lesson <coughs> in, in very, in brief, we actually talked about uh, the higher layers. As we said that we are not going to discuss the higher layers in uh, great depth because, because of various reasons, because firstly it takes time to cover only you know level 0 and level 1, so we do not have enough time. Secondly, higher layers are some often very domain dependent while level 0 and level 1 technologies are domain independent and, uh, and they apply to a wide variety of plants. If you want to do, if you want to know how to do set point optimization, then you can, you, you have to only talk about set point optimization for either a distillation column or a boiler or a, or a, or a, or a whatever. So, so they become very process specific and therefore difficult to discuss in a course. So in this lesson, in the last lesson, last penultimate lesson, the basic features of, you know, supervisory control and uh, ma ma manufacturing management were discussed. So we talked about uh, level two automation functions such, such that set point optimization and process monitoring. So one, uh, they, they have, they have, they actually, uh, actually this is a wrong. It should be, it should be set point generation and process monitoring. Uh, this, this is a typo. Uh, then we talked about level three automation functions where we uh, talked about basically planning, scheduling uh, and basically planning and scheduling. So how the various, uh, we did not go into much depth th though. Then on top of that we have, so we have level 2 systems and level 2 systems which are still with the controls. Then level, some bit of level 2 and basically level 3 systems are generally reside in a different type of computer and the, their computing and techniques are completely different. So they are called manufacturing execution systems. And then in level 4 we have business systems which do, which employ technologies like uh, supply chain management, enterprise resource planning and therefore and basically they generate long range plans, they generate market projections, they, they actually decide how, I mean how much how much order has to be taken, what are the commitments, deadlines and then they pass it on to the manufacturing execution systems which in turn then decide that, that with the available equipment, manpower, raw materials, how exactly production should go so it's, I mean, such that all the production deadlines are met and then these production, production sequences and detailed production sequences are passed on to the supervisory controller which then actually gets about producing. So this is the way it goes on. So in the last lesson we uh, discussed these higher level automation functions. So that brings us to the end of this lesson and so having discussed what has, what has been cov covered, we should also uh, take a look at what has not been covered, at least we should be aware of some of the things that we have not covered which were, which were also relevant. So for example, as we have said that <coughs> we have <coughs> mainly concentrated on level 0 and 1. So level 2 and 3 have not been covered in great detail, that is the first thing. But even in level 0 <coughs> and 1, there are certain, certain parts which could have been covered but could not be covered, you know you have to always leave out certain things. For example, we did not take a, take a detailed look, of, look at metrology or which are widely used for you know quality control, we, we did not take a look at analytical instruments which are used for process uh, product composition testing. We did not look at, uh, look in great depth on instrument standards and calibration. 
Similarly, in terms of control, as we said that we, uh, while we looked at the PID controller and, so, and some of the standard process control architectures, there are some advanced controls which are coming and which are gradually becoming, uh, gradually also being applied in uh, processes and manufacturing, we did not discuss them, like nonlinear model predictive control. Uh, the, the PLC treatment was also kept more or less, you know, the, the, the standard techniques. PLCs have several programming languages, they, so, so we did not discuss all of them. We only discussed the real ladder logic in uh, detail and then the sequential function chart in some detail. So, in other words, what I am trying to say is that in case somebody is interested, one can, uh, one can go ahead and uh, read other supplementary or advanced level material for knowing the latest in these fields, which is, which would be the, which uh, beyond what has been covered in this course. Similarly, in level 2, we did not discuss various kinds of quantitative optimization techniques, linear, nonlinear programming. Uh, we did not discuss advanced monitoring and diagnostics techniques, some of which have just started becoming, uh, being applied, they are quite advanced. We did not deal with, you know, as I said, level 3 and 4, we hardly talked about it and there are very uh, detailed scheduling, uh, scheduling and uh, optimization techniques available. We, for example, enterprise resource planning can be a course in itself. So, <coughs> having said that, I would make the final concluding comments of this course. Uh, this course was thought of because such a course actually is rare. You have, you rarely have, you do not have books or materials which uh, discuss this, uh, I mean the industrial automation technology is all within one cover. So, that was one of the main motivating factors of having this course. And this course, it, it was also felt that can be useful for uh, various kinds of student backgrounds of, I mean, for students from, I mean engineering undergraduate students from, uh, from, from, from mechanical, chemical, uh, electrical, etc. So, uh, the, the major focus and coverage uh, was kept suitable for, uh, the major focus and coverage was uh, kept suitable for the, uh, for the undergraduate level. We have just discussed what, what has been covered. So, reference and supplementary materials have been used from a variety of sources, several uh, texts, internet, my own class notes, handbooks. So, because it's, 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 it's simply because, uh, in fact, they were, but in, in all case, while I have, while I, have, I mean, we have not, within the limits of this course, it has not been possible to, it, it, it would not have been possible to cite all of them. So, I, we have left out, left them out all together. But in all cases, while we have, I have certainly referred to various kinds of material, I have tried to, you know, present them in my own ways. So, that way the presentations in many cases, I mean, in all cases are original. We have not been able to give again because of, you know, short, we have not been able to discuss numerical problems. So, uh, in fact, one, one has to find out numerical problems from individual uh, modules like for example, uh, numerical problems on control can be found from process control books. Uh, <coughs> similarly, drives may be from ele uh, power electronics and drives books and things like that. Uh, another thing is that under the same NPTEL program, a, a, an associated web based course has also been developed by myself and Professor S. Sen of, uh, of IIT Kharagpur and we will be able to give some of these, <coughs> refer to, you know, I, mean, I mean, address some of these problems of numerical problems, questions, answers, references in uh, those web courses. So, that is all for today. Uh, I hope, I hope these, this, this course would be useful and well, yes. Uh, after recording these courses, I am right now teaching these courses in my own classes using the same set of slides and I have discovered a few errors. So, while in the final version, some of these errors will get removed, uh, I am sure that some of them might 
still stay various kinds of errors I hope there are no major errors. So, in case there are errors and if you declare if you uh, find them and, and you can inform me I will be I will be grateful, but I will uh, apologize in advance for any errors that may be present here. But I always feel that you know huh, if one can correct an error in a particular part of any learning material he probably uh, learns that part of the material the best. So, there you are this is, the, this is the end of the course thank you very much and bye bye.